potluck day. Woo! I can smell it from here. You gonna make it? You ready? I don't want to catch you off guard here. We're not doing honky tonk woman. I don't care what you say. Why not? <laughs> I'm telling you, people are nuts. Okay. It's Dale's turn to open the service. Yeah. Anyways, those of you who have heard some good news, there is good news. He's just eating up a storm. Uh, I guess they, yeah, yeah, amen, and they pulled, they are pulling or did pull out his feeding tube. They're going to, okay. He's eating, yeah, so he's getting stronger, wants to come home, so hopefully shortly we'll be able to see him again. Praise the Lord, but until then, I'll have to open. Father, thank you for this fellowship, for this time that we come together to exalt your name. You are indeed worthy. We want to thank you for everything, all the blessings. It's just, we can't even count them. But Lord, be exalted in the midst of your people today. Uh, lead us and guide us. We're looking forward to, to lifting up your name through worship and the preaching of the word and, and fellowship. And Lord, of course, breaking bread together later. It's just a wonderful day. We want to give you thanks and we want you to be exalted in the midst of your people. In Jesus' name, they all said, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, my God, when I am the awesome wonder, consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the sun. I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When through the wood and forest glades I wander and hear the soul. Singing in the tree When I look down From lofty mountain center And hear the grass And feel the evening breeze Then sing my soul My Savior God to thee how great thou art, how great thou art. And sing my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Sing the verse. Then sings my soul, 
my Savior God to thee. How, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, oh, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, when Christ will come with songs of acclamation, and in the home, what joy shall fill my heart, then I shall bow. In humble adoration And there proclaim My God, how great thou art Then sings my soul How great thou art, how great thou art. Indeed, how great. How great is our God, amen? You ever just sat there and couldn't think of any better words? It just wouldn't flow. You're trying to take your greater words and greater words to, to express your love for him and just ran out of words I'm believing that in eternity he'll implant a dictionary into our minds Amen. so we can worship him uh, as he deserves with words that we may not even know now The splendor of a king Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light Darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age, he stands. Time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb. Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Your turn. How great
How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Let's sing it again. How great name above our God. going to glorify him for eternity while well, we're busy doing things that he assigns to us. I can't wait to that city whose builder and architect is God. That's going to be a fine, fine city to live in. Amen. We will well, I get the right pitch. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before His throne. We will worship Him in righteousness. We will worship him alone. He is Lord of heaven and the earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Tell the theme today is the glory of God, because the message today is about the Davidic covenant and how David wanted to build a house, a glorious house, to the glory of God. And we're going to see how that turned out. But nevertheless, his intentions were right. We should all glorify the Lord. 
every moment of the day. Oh, behold how good He is, our Lord God Most High. Blessings falling from His throne, flowing from on high. Glory in the highest, we exalt your name. Hosanna on high to him who reigns. From the top. Oh, behold how good he is. Our Lord God most high. Blessings falling from his throne, flowing from on high. Glory in the highest, we exalt your name, Hosanna on high to Again, glory in the highest, we exalt your name, Hosanna on high to him who reigns, Jesus how we love Our Lord God most high. And to feel your spirit flowing from on high. Glory in the highest. We exalt your name. Hosanna on high to Glory in the highest, we exalt your name, Hosanna on high to him who reigns. Glory in the highest, we exalt your name. Hosanna on high to him who reigns. Glory in the highest, we exalt your name. Hosanna on high to him who reigns. Hosanna on high to him who reigns. One of the things we were looking at in Sunday school today was the beginning of the book of Malachi. Malachi is built in a kind of courtroom scenario where the Lord makes an accusation against his people. And they go, no, that ain't true. That's not true. And then he follows up with a proof. Pretty tough stuff. But in, in the end, when you look at the whole thing, he's not doing it to cause harm, but to make sure that his people understand that regardless of the situation, regardless of their sins, regardless of their foolishness, his love never ends. And it will remain forever. 
Jeremiah writes that in the book of Lamentations as he stands among the burning ruins of Jerusalem. Bodies, fire, just horror. And he still remembers God's covenant faithfulness. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Now that is a man of faith. It's one thing to praise God on the mountain, amen? It's something else in the valley. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are free every morning, new every morning. Great is thy love and grace, O Lord. Great is thy love and grace. The endless grace of the Lord never ceases. Gift of love never comes to an end. Forgiving new life, never ending. Great is thy love and grace, O oh Lord. Great is thy love and grace. Go to the top. Steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never. It's a tough line, isn't it? And they are new.
because of his love, this ought to bring back some memories. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me. What key is this on? A. Oh. This loves me. He who died. Heaven's gate. Open wide, he who was away my sin. Let this little child come in. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Father, we love you and we know that you love us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit which helps us to persevere. We thank you for your word, which helps us to persevere in the right direction. And we thank you for the body of Christ, the church, that gives us counsel when we're wavering on the direction we're going. We thank you that you have provided everything we need for righteousness and holiness and godliness. What would we do without you? Where would we be? We would be lost. The fact that you chose us before the foundation of the earth speaks of your grace. We see your grace throughout the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation as a constant theme, a constant thread, that you have a people that you have called out for yourself, that you have equipped, that you have blessed a remnant, and you shall be their God, and they shall be your people. We thank you, for there is no greater gift in the universe than that. And in Jesus' name, they all say, amen. Amen. Let's take a little time to fellowship. (laughs) Yeah, okay. All right, we're in 2 Samuel, chapter 7. We're only going to take seven verses. Uh, This chapter, this chapter is a linchpin, actually. Uh, 
chapter 7 of 2 Samuel is where the Davidic covenant is, comes into play. It's been promised forever. But this is where we get to see it unfold. This is a very, very powerful chapter. And one of the things I discovered, there's all sorts of little things in here that you just might read over and not pay attention to. But they're powerful. This is crazy stuff going on. And so it's intended to catch our attention. It's intended to show us things. In other words, this thing's jam-packed with all sorts of cool stuff. And we're going to look at a few of those. We always need to remember when we're studying any book of Scripture that God has a, a historical narrative, redemptive narrative. It's called the historical redemptive narrative that, that goes, well, before the foundation of the world and all the way through to the end. It's historical and then it covers all history. And it's the story of his redemption. It's what God does to save a people for himself. It's really quite simple. You get too confusing with people theologically about all these different things here and there. And you're trying to figure out this chart and that chart and what happens with that prophet. And where's this prophecy going? And you know, No wonder people are confused. It's confusing. And as Mandy said earlier, God is not the author of confusion. She said that in Sunday school. I thought that was quite apropos for today. So we're going to look and see how an individual book such as 2 Samuel foreshadows and confirms the coming of God's Son. See, this is why it's important. The eternal promise of the Messiah is about to hit the scene in a way that we haven't seen before. Oh, it's been there from the beginning. Genesis 3.15 prophesied it. But all of a sudden, here it is. And let's take a look and see how that all happened. We know that Moses led Israel out of Egypt, right? Out of bondage. That was a big event. We know that Joshua conquered the, the land of Canaan, you know, with the Israelites. And that was quite a big, big event. But after that, we enter into this dark period, this period of the judges where every man did what was right in his own eyes. You know, like Washington, D.C. today which is why we have the garbage going on that we have going on. That's called anarchy. Right now, it's still minimal. But if you've been watching the news, you're starting to see there's, things are starting to pop up, and, pe and violence is starting to increase, and people have just had enough here, and then they've had enough there. And you see this stuff going on, and you think, Lord, what's happening here? Well, what's happening here is what always happens. When people decide to get rid of God and just go based on their feelings or whatever they want, to, their own ideologies, their own philosophies, it gets crazy because there's only one truth, and that's the God of truth. Anything else is a substitute and is destined for disaster. That's what we saw during the period of the judges. So God then brings forth the monarchy. And we know the whole deal with Saul and what a rotten situation that was, blah, blah, blah. But all of it is to come full force to our attention when David finally has peace. His enemies have been subdued. He's got other nations, Hiram, Tyre, sending materials and craftsmen to build David a palace. He's doing quite well. But it's gotten quiet. It's gotten peaceful. Some people can't live that way. If you've been living on an adrenaline rush, and all of a sudden everything's just... You might get a little fidgety, and that's what we're looking at as we begin to explore what's going on in this passage. We know that Saul rebelled against the Lord, right? Israel's king. I know, you know, there's a bad deal about that people wanted a king just like the other nations. And God says, uh, oy vey, you know. So he gives them Saul. But we see that Saul rebels against God's word. And we all know what happened there. You know, he wasn't supposed to offer up the sacrifice. And he did because Samuel was late. And, and then, then with the Amalekites, he didn't. It was all under the ban. Everything was to be destroyed. But no, I saved some of the sheep. I saved some of this. I saved some of that. Open rebellion. Open rebellion to God's word. And God said, that's it. You're done. I've raised up someone else. And we know how that 
began, we began there with David, the young David in the pasture with Samuel looking around at all the brothers and saying, mm, no, these guys, no. Do you have any other brothers anywhere? Well, we got the youngest one out watching the sheep, but we didn't think that was worthwhile to bring him in. I mean, you know, he says, go get him. And of course, that's God's anointed. The books of Samuel reveal the rise and the reign of King David following the fast-paced events of David's enthronement, his conquest of Jerusalem, defeat of the Philistines, settling the ark on Mount Zion. Boy, after that, God provides peace and stability to his anointed king and his people. It was during this reign of peace that God promised to raise up David's messianic son. It would be David's greater son, not Solomon. David's greater son who would build a house for God and usher in the eternal kingdom. That's why this passage, this chapter, is so important to the messianic story of, of the coming of Christ. The Davidic covenant. God kept that thing in motion no matter how the demonic world tried to destroy it and cut it off and do this and do that. No, because Jesus was coming. Jesus was coming. And God kept that line, the Davidic line, intact all the way until it was down. Remember, I don't know if you remember this, but there was just one little grandchild left, and his grandma was trying to kill him. It would have been the last of the Davidic line. But no, God rescued the youngster, had a nurse take him aside. They raised him up quietly, privately, somewhere else, and the line continues until we see in Jerusalem in the first century the coming of Christ, David's greater son. Do you remember when the blind men along the road, I forget which gospel, probably Matthew, sounds like something he'd do, uh, son of David, son of David, they're trying to catch his attention. He's going by. The whole entourage is coming by. Thousands of people are along the road because all sorts of big things are happening in Jerusalem. And they're screaming out. You know, they're beggars because they're blind. They've been blind from birth. Son of David, son of David. And everybody tells them, shut up. Quit hassling the guy. We want to hear what he has to say. Who do you think you are? And Jesus stopped. What would you like me to do for you? Everybody else, of course, is going, we just told him to shut up. We want to see. But the funny thing is, they were already seen. Everybody else was blind. When they called him son of David, that is a specific messianic title. And it has everything you think it has in it. Go tell John this is what you see. The lame walk, the blind see, and the deaf hear. Why did Jesus say to go back and tell John the Baptist these things? Because those are the works of the Messiah. That's how you know this is the one God spoke to David about. And the blind guys can see it. Everybody else couldn't. This is a very powerful storyline that's happening right in front of us. Again, it would be David's greater son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would build a house for God and usher in the eternal kingdom. Therefore, 2 Samuel 7 is an Old Testament preview and promise of the coming Messiah, the Davidic son of David who would build a temple of living stones. You've heard that phrase before. You're the living stones that he's building into his house where God might be glorified. And he would save his people from their sins. Let's look at the text, verse 1. 1 Samuel, excuse me, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1. Titled this, The Man After God's Heart. We know that's David. That's his moniker. That's what he's known for. We've looked at his ups and downs and thinking, how in the world did God allow him to be called that? 
But God did allow him to be called out. And we've seen over and over. He, David could screw up better than anybody. But he knew how to repent. And he knew how to glorify God. He knew how to humble himself before the Lord. Man after God's heart. Now, when the king, that's David, lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, which is a way of saying I dwell in a really nice, fancy place. But the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. Hold that thought. Let's look at David. He's a king that wants to honor God, unlike Saul, right? David wants to honor God. He's been wanting to do that. He even wanted to do that when he was bringing the ark in the wrong way, and poor old Uzzah got blasted. He still was trying to do it to honor God, so we know it was good intentions, but sorry, good intentions don't cut it. And so now we see, again, he has peace on all sides. That's the time you can reflect. You can start to look around and say, what can I? And he, he says, you know what? Here, I'm, all, I'm so blessed. I've got a neighboring king sending people over. I didn't even ask him to do it, but he's built me a mansion, a palace to live in. And yet, the ark of God is still in that tent that I set up for him. This isn't right. This has to be changed. He wants to honor God. He's the man, the king, who wants to honor God. That's a good thing. We have talked about this before, about uh, Hiram, king of Tyre. We don't know how many years David had settled, been settled in when all of this took place. Therefore, we don't know how many years the Ark of the Covenant had just been sitting under that tent. Either there's a time thing we don't know. It's not there. We don't have it. But we do know this, that there's been enough time for God to put David, his king, at rest. He's not having to fight battles. He's not sending out the troops. He's taking care of business around here. He's doing this. He's doing that. But now he's getting, he's getting a bit restless. David's ambitions at this point were as far as we can see had been all realized. I mean, what was left to do? It's a place of rest or maybe for some boredom. How many retired people do you know who said, I just don't know what to do with myself anymore. I've got to find something to do. Well, that's kind of that attitude, that feeling. Like, I'm restless. I, I've spent my whole life being active, getting up. I have a schedule. I, I do this. I do that. I come home. I, but now, I, 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 so we say, well, do volunteer work. Do this. Do that. You know, thinking we're helping. Well, who knows if we're helping. But that's the feeling people get when everything is all of a sudden at rest. After seasons of activity. It's difficult for overachievers to be at rest. Now, I don't know if we would call David an overachiever, but I will. This had to have been tough on him because all of a sudden we see him going, well, I, got, I got to do something. I got to do something. I'm going to honor God. All right, not bad. Not a bad thought. But there always must be new challenges, new mountains to climb. And poor old David, he's in a dilemma. He's lived a life of action. He's been fueled by adrenaline. And now all is quiet. All is quiet on the Western Front. What's he going to devote his energies to, this man after God's own heart? How is he going to devote his time and his wealth, his energy? Well, we know that for Christians, the antidote to restless inactivity is to devote oneself and one's resources to honoring God. Well, that sounds familiar. That's what David's going to try and do. Oops. Advancing the gospel. Serving Christ's church. 
These are things that people can do when they now have the time and the resources uh, and they feel God's leading them to, to, to be more of a part of what he's doing through the local church. That's all good stuff. And this is what David did as far as he knew how within the old covenant context that we're dealing with. I don't know. Maybe he was residing on a couch, a luxurious couch in his palace and was just contemplating the grace of God, the goodness of God, how God had poured out his love and grace upon him over and over and over. Just, just think about how many hours he could have spent thinking about the Goliath incident. And then, and then everything that followed it. Was he contemplating these things? I don't know. It's possible. He saw the disparity between his luxurious palace and the humble tent where the ark resided. As the man after God's heart, David sought to rectify this situation. Don't you know he was going to go there? You just know that's next. Because that's so David-like. See, he was troubled that he, a servant, was living in honor while the very symbol of God's presence and majesty dwelt in a common tent. So what did David do? He set his mind to honor God. And they all said, Amen. Amen. There's nothing wrong with that, is there? To set your mind to honor God, that's good. That's fine. There's no problem with that. How you do it is now a different conversation. And that's what we're going to look at here. Remember the prophet Haggai, or Haggai, depending on how you like to pronounce it? He would have been thrilled with David, because remember that whole deal with Haggai was that the people weren't rebuilding the temple. That's why they were brought back from Babylon out of exile. And they were told, rebuild the temple, you know, because God wants to dwell here in the midst of his people. He's brought you back from bondage again. And he wants to dwell in your midst. It's a sign. It's a prophetic sign of what God is like and what he wants to do. But the people got all tired of it, you know. They were having problems. They were running into economic issues, and the surrounding neighbors weren't being very nice to them. They were crying and whining. And so what did they do? They spent all their energy and time building their own paneled houses while the temple of God remained undone. Now, Haggai obviously comes much later than David. I just wonder if he was channeling his inner David when he was prophesying to the people and said, Hey, what is up with this? Why are you all living in paneled houses and going about your business and not doing anything God has asked you to do? He rescued you from Babylon. Wow. I guess Haggai was probably pretty thrilled we see that David had a thankful heart, which is a prerequisite to being a man after God's heart, by the way. A heart of thankfulness for all that God has done. So we see David. We kind of see where he's at. We see what he's dealing with. But let's look at Nathan now, the prophet wanting to speak for God. We're, we get introduced to Nathan here, and he's going to have a long history with David. We know that because we've read through this before. He's going to play an important role throughout David's reign. Nathan seems to be a perceptive man, and he can sense the godly zeal that's motivating David to build a house for God. Uh, he sees everything is, is good. Everything's great here. That's a good thing to want to do. All right, David, whatever's in your heart, you know, you do that. After all, he, David's displaying the characteristics of a godly man. He desires to honor God, and he's wise. Why? Because he seeks godly counsel. Another plus for David. So David summoned Nathan, the prophet, because he wanted to know the mind of God concerning his plan to build a house for the ark. So far, so good. He's hitting all the right mile markers in this journey. 
We have to admit, David was spot on, seeking godly wisdom. Who else but the prophet of God, the mouthpiece of God, right? You go to him. All the scripture in the Old Testament hadn't been written, all of it. I mean, they had their portions, they had the Torah, but there was a lot that was still being written at this time. So he knows what the law is, because they have the Torah. They have the first five books of the Bible. That's not a problem. But God provided prophets for that season that they didn't have the written word so much that we take for granted, that we see after the first five books about all that stuff. Powerful stuff, stuff we live our lives by. So David goes to the, the man of God, the prophet, the mouthpiece of God, to find out what he should do. Now we know that we have a greater advantage than David did. Amen? Amen. We not only have the Holy Spirit, who is our divine counselor, we also have the counsel of God's holy word. It's finished, by the way. It's done. Don't let anybody tell you there's more coming. There's not. We also have the counsel of the local church. The people of God who come together and lift up and encourage one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and provide good counsel and godly wisdom for situations. That's why we're together. That's why we're not to forsake the assembling together as some do. See, I don't need to go to church. You know, I can, we were talking about this earlier with Loretta. You know, someone said, well, I could, I could watch all that on TV. Yes, you can, and that's a good thing to do. I, don't, I applaud you for doing that. But that's not in place of being part of a local body. Because God wants you part of a local body because he created the local body because he knows that you need it. You have stuff to offer. They have stuff to offer you. Nobody's got it all together. We need one another. That's why the church exists. You know, obviously to promote the gospel and all that, but part of that process is to be the body of Christ and to lift one another up, to encourage one another. For instance, if you plan to start a ministry or pursue a project for God, it's wise to present the idea before mature believers. You can say, well, okay, the elders of the church or whatever, but you could have people that you're in a Bible study with that you believe are more mature than you, that have godly wisdom. You can go to them. You can go to anybody in the church. It would be a good thing to do. And generally, we will receive good biblical counsel and can proceed with confidence or scrap the idea and save ourselves a lot of time, finances, and heartache. There's a risk to seeking godly counsel. It might not be what you want to hear. You ever run into that? Someone comes to you for biblical counsel and you give it to them right out of the word and they go, no, that's not how I feel. How you feel? That has nothing to do with this at all. Oh, no, I feel, I, I've got to have God's peace. I've got to feel that. Well, I don't have a problem with God's peace, but if you're basing everything on your feelings, you're in a world of trouble. Too many believers seek counsel to appear spiritual, but then will not receive advice. And in so doing, they reveal questionable motives and an unteachable nature. That's dangerous. If you're not teachable, you're a danger to yourself and everyone around you. David pours out his God-honoring plan to Nathan, as he should, and the prophet gives it his stamp of approval. He says, go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. Well, you can't fault David at that point, right? I mean, he went and got godly counsel, and the guy said, go ahead and do what you're supposed to do. Yeah, and whatever in your heart. We see Nathan's quite the encourager. That's a good thing. But unfortunately, his advice is wrong. Now, this should cause you to start thinking something. Wait a minute. Did you just say 
that the prophet of God was wrong? I didn't see it. Scripture said it. Because the very next verses we're going to see, God says, whoa there, Sparky. You gave him bad advice. You go back and tell him this. Doesn't that cause anybody to go, huh? This opens the door for questions concerning the requirement of accuracy from a prophet of God. See, this could just slide right by as you're reading. But this is powerful. This is something that must be investigated. We need to look at this. What's going on here? Because we know from reading Scripture, Deuteronomy 18.20, but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. Well, that should be the first thing to come to your mind. I'm not saying we all understand it all yet because we're going to look at this. But that's the thing that sparked, just jumped in front of me. Went, Whoa! We must solve this situation before we move on. I need to know what's going on here. This is troubling. The question becomes, is Nathan a false prophet? Hey, I'm getting everything all around the room. Yeah, it's a tough one, isn't it? But that's the question that we must ask. And it's a fair question. And here's your answer. No, he is not. And here's why. You see, Nathan's not the one that proposed, in the name of the Lord, the idea for David to build a house for the ark. That was strictly David's idea. So he didn't come up with it and didn't start it. Now, he should have slowed down a little bit, but that's neither here nor there. It wasn't his idea. And also, at the same time, Nathan isn't declaring thus says the Lord. Once you do that, you can't be wrong. That's historically accurate. You got, and he didn't do that, did he? Hey, whatever's in your heart, go do that. Sounds like a great deal. Dude, what are you doing? You set David up for some real come to Jesus moments here. And we know that Nathan didn't give him David this advice from a desire to profit monetarily or to speak in the name of other gods or to gain authority over the people. Those are all the marks of a false prophet. The Bible describes false prophets as adulterous, treacherous, drunkards, wicked, liars, and proponents of divination and witchcraft. Washington, D.C., I told you. Nathan exhibits none of these characteristics. So what's going on here? How are we supposed to understand this? Because it's a little bit perplexing on the surface. Well, it appears that Nathan sees David's desire to exalt the glory of God, and he agrees that's a very good thing David seeks to do. And it is. He was right. Exalting God's glory is always a good thing for us to do. In short, all the requirements to stone a false prophet do not apply to this situation. That's why Nathan continues to breathe oxygen after this and be David's counselor. In fact, David and Nathan are moving into an area that is far above their pay grade, and that's what's happening. They had no idea where they were entering. And God says, all right, everybody, calm down. I'm going to explain something to you way beyond their pay grade. They're about to get thrown into the deep end of the theological pool. Neither king nor prophet have any idea of the powerful messianic truth God is about to reveal regarding God's covenant with the house of David. So we can cut them some slack here. Cut them some slack. What else do we find here? I mean, that was enough, right? That'd keep you busy for a while trying to figure all that out. Because it is perplexing. 
but then as we dig in, as we dig in, we didn't realize, oh, 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 yeah, this is not as bad as it looked at first. Okay, good. Everything's cool. Everything's good. Whew, that was scary. But let's look at verse 4, beginning there. Because good intentions, by the way, are not always God's will. Did you catch that? Good intentions are not always God's will. Ask Uzzah next time you see him. Verse 4, but that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, go and tell my servant. In other words, you gave him bad advice there, Sparky. You need to go and pull that back a little bit, but explain this to him and it'll all make sense. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I've been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? God doesn't need David to build him a house. David wants to honor God, and the first thing he thinks of is building a house for the ark. That makes sense. Can't fault him for that. But God's trying to say, whoa, it's time to recalibrate some things that you need to know. This is bigger than you. This is bigger than your abilities as king. This is bigger than you and Nathan pooling your energies together. I'm about to unload on you something that you're just going to go, whoa. You see, God's telling David, that's a really wonderful sentiment, David. I, I just appreciate that. But you know what? I'll build my own house. Thank you very much. David received encouragement from Nathan, but he received wrong counsel from him at the same time. What we encounter here is the contrast between man's reasoning that is subject to sin's contamination. You realize that, right? Our reasoning abilities are contaminated by sin which is why we need to be led by the Spirit so we don't fulfill the desires of the flesh. Because the battle's going on, right? The world versus, you know, we're not of the world. We're here, but we're not of it. And we're battling constantly, wanting to walk by the Spirit and not fulfill the desires of the flesh, which means we need to stay focused on Christ. It, yeah, all of that God has provided. Because otherwise, we're sunk. We're dead. Dead in the water. If we don't have Jesus counseling us constantly. If we can't dwell in his presence, if we can't have his word, we're, we're doomed. But he's provided all of that. Again, man's reasoning is subject to sin's contamination. Obviously, Nathan did not consult the Lord for direction, but he counseled David based on his own judgment. The prophet's judgment was wrong, and God had to correct his stinking thinking. Some of you know where that comes from. Anyways, David and Nathan's reasoning was not sanctified through divine revelation. It was just a good idea on their part. But God is saying, no, you didn't go through me on this one. Here's the problem. You see, their tainted thinking naturally gravitated towards works. What can I do for God? Which is another way of saying, how can I prove I'm righteous? Now, David didn't see that. Nathan didn't see that. God saw it and stopped him. He said, this isn't about you and your works. I appreciate the sentiment. You want to honor me. I get all that. But you don't understand what's going down here. It was honorable that David wanted to accomplish a great work to honor God, but this future temple would be a prophetic sign of God's great work of eternal redemption. I don't think David had the blueprints for that house. That's beyond his scope. Such an undertaking was all divine grace, and it was devoid 
of man's works. God provides a subtle reminder that he alone chose David from the sheep pasture and elevated him to being prince over Israel. David had nothing to add to God's choosing of him. It was election. And God's grace never allows for man's efforts. This is the lesson that they're starting to learn. Now, most of us are familiar with God's reason for not allowing David to build the temple. David was a man of war, bloodshed. We see that in Chronicles and 1 Kings. And that's true. I mean, it's part of the deal. But it's not the reason given to David through Nathan. The actual or the full reason is God reveals that he intends to build a salvation home. For his people. It will be through Christ, a Christ, it will be through a Christ redeemed people who will happen to be God's living stones. And he's going to build a house for his own name. It doesn't need our efforts. Even our best intentions don't count. He's going to build it himself. And that's where Jesus comes in, obviously. That's why this chapter is so powerful. They're starting to see something that no one else really understood at all prior to this. This is big stuff. We know in 1 Peter 2, 5, you know, he confirms all of this. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That's what this is all about. Embedded... In this initial revelation regarding the Davidic covenant and God's ultimate redemptive act through Christ, we also observe the danger of trusting in our own reasoning abilities apart from the Spirit's leading in God's sure word. You could skip right over this and not see that if you don't slow down. You see, here's the problem. Our conscience can be compromised. You know that's true, right? Your conscience can be compromised. We compromise it. You see, we're created in the Imago Dei, which is the image of God. We know that's true. We've read that in Scripture. We're created in the image of God. No other species has a conscious as a conscience, and that's spelled wrong, because no other species is created in the image of God. Because of Adam's fall, all are corrupt from conception. Hence, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Our conscience is God's gift. He gives to those made in his image. It's from God. It's a good thing, our conscience. But it is contaminated by sin. And depending on what we desire, we can manipulate and justify our conscience to fit our agenda. Paul says it this way in Romans 2.15. That's what the picture's about. Maybe, no, yeah, okay, I can, I can see doing that. But then again, you know, it says this, no, but wait a minute, I might, you know, I could, if I make an end around the word of God, I can, I can just, oh, okay, here's how Paul puts it. They show, talking about sinners, that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. You know what I'm talking about. Have you ever designed something in your own mind that you knew God wasn't really in favor of, but you began to weigh this and weigh that? That's the picture of the little devil and the little angel. Because our conscience is contaminated, and it needs to be constantly brought to the throne of God so that he can teach us about what's happening. He can reveal to us what we're doing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we have this ability, this super rationalizing engine 
It's called our conscience. And our conscience is being redeemed through sanctification process. We got born again. Our conscience is now being perfected, made more like the Son of God as we move along through our Christian life, as we're conformed to the image of Christ. But it's a process, and most of you sitting in here know what I'm talking about. You've had those seasons where you thought, if I could just do this to so-and-so, I'd, I'd teach them a lesson. Then you begin to think, but yeah, then I might have to ask for repentance. But then again, he deserves it. And maybe God's asking me to be his avenging angel. Now, if you never had a dialogue like that in your head, you haven't lived. And that's when you see how important it is to be led by the Spirit so that you won't fulfill the desires of the flesh because they're constantly at war with one another. Jiminy Cricket was a poor counselor to Pinocchio because he said, always let your conscience be your guide. That's just not true. Allowing your, always allowing your conscience to be your guide can yield disastrous results if your conscience is not under the authority of Scripture. It has a lying twin sister. That twin sister's name is follow your heart. Your conscience or heart is included in your inner man. And without spiritual regeneration, that's meaning born again. The inner man is irredeemably corrupt. And with Christ, our inner man is redeemed and slowly being conformed to the image of Christ by God the Father. This means we have the potential to be led by the Spirit. But that requires being focused on Christ and His Word. So that we can avoid the desires of the flesh. That is, of course, if we want to deny the desires of the flesh. Sometimes our conscience will accuse or excuse our thoughts in a rationalistic tug of war. So this all application, just because you want to do something doesn't mean it is the Holy Spirit telling you to do it. That should not be a shock to anyone. Just because it feels right to you doesn't mean it is God-ordained. Nathan learned that lesson. Christians are not to order their life based on feelings. A conscience fixed on feeling, feelings becomes unreliable. Just ask anyone you know who suffers depression. Our conscience is not necessarily the voice of God. That voice in your head may not be God speaking, no matter how it substantiates your feelings. It is paramount that we cultivate our conscience so that it aligns with God's written word. Then, what we hear can be measured against the sure word of God, and then we can operate boldly in the Spirit. Consequently, the born-again believers should obey the conscience as a general rule, unless we are convinced by the Holy Spirit in Scripture that our conscience needs an adjustment or a calibration. A calibration. Sometimes our conscience needs fine-tuning or a calibration to get in line with what God says. A conscience subjected to the, word of, to the Word will be focused on Christ and able to provide reliable feedback. Such a conscience will be cleansed from dead works, Hebrews 9, and it will be blameless toward God and men, Acts 24. A trustworthy conscience is a powerful aid in spiritual growth. But we've got to subject it to the Spirit and to the Word. Or we'll just go off and do whatever we feel is right in our own eyes. So as we end, there are seasons when God grants us rest and peace from strife. You need to enjoy those times. They're wonderful, right, when they come around. But they are temporary. David's deliverance from his enemies was a season David had not known for many years. Yet it's during such times we may need deliverance from ourselves. By God's grace, David was at peace. 
And in that quiet period, David sought to glorify God through his own efforts. It was admirable that David's desire was to elevate God's glory and build him a house worthy of his name. But God had eternal plans to build himself a house of living stones. And of course, David was not aware of God's redemptive plan through Christ, the greater son of David. God's connection, or excuse me, God's correction through Nathan was an order for David to stay in his lane. That's good advice for everyone. Stay in your lane. What has God called you to be and to do? Then do that. Stay there. Don't try and do everybody else's stuff. There's not enough time and you don't have enough energy to pull that off. David's choice to seek godly counsel was a mark of David's maturity. But Nathan's agreement with David's desire to build a house only reveals that even the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. Nathan, God's prophet, had to be corrected by a visit from Yahweh and set straight about what God was doing prophetically through the house of David. All's well that ends well, but this passage is a great object lesson about the human conscience. Our sin-damaged conscience needs constant recalibrating through the healing work of God's Spirit, His Word, and his church. Our well-intentioned desires may not align with God's perfect purposes. And it takes a mature believer to humble themselves and submit to God's correcting will. But it is well worth it. As David will find out. Father, we thank you for your word. This powerful passage where you're, you're just, just unloading the whole, the whole Davidic line, the promises that Christ fulfills. We want to thank you for that. It just, it's stimulating, it's encouraging, and we keep seeing new things you're bringing out in the midst of the storyline. So thank you for that. Help us to see that as we continue to go through the material. In Jesus' name, amen. And Lord, bless the food because we're all hungry and we can smell it. In Jesus' name, amen.